Let's play a game. Look at this pocket knife. Regardless of whether or not you'd even consider buying a pocket knife, how much would you say it's worth on site? $20, $50, $100, $500? $500? Whatever you have anchored in your mind, I want you to hang on to it as we finish this game in a minute or two, because as you and I both know, every attempted debate about what constitutes as a budget or expensive is pointless since everyone's financial situation is different, and more importantly, everyone has different use cases. The real way for you to determine this for yourself is to rotate around three axes, beginning with evaluating the price versus the cost. And yes, those are two wildly different things. The price of something is, of course, what the label says. The cost includes all the downstream financial implications. But what the heck does that even mean? Check it out. Let's go with my packed travel backpack and unbound merino travel clothes. The prices are high, but as someone who, for work, needs to sail on at least 20 flights a year, the costs are very low. But how? In a few months, I'll be headed from my home in Toronto to Atlanta, just a brief two and a half hour flight. But after scouring all airlines that cloud hop between the two cities, the cheapest check baggage fee I found is 35 US dollars. So if I had a checked luggage and would have to pay at least 35 US dollars for each of my 20 flights per year, that's an extra cost of 700 US dollars a year minimum. This means that buying the high priced things that have enabled my carry on only travel for so many years not only paid for themselves in the first year or two against check baggage fees alone, but continues to save me over $700 each and every year. But that's not all. The ongoing savings continue to amplify because beyond that, as just one of several other examples, when I go to places like Jakarta with no checked luggage and instead just a packed backpack and a sling, I can zip around town on super cheap scooter taxis instead of cabs that folks with luggage have no choice but to use. Not to mention the literal 5x time savings of using scooters versus cars and you tell me, what's your precious time worth? But you're probably thinking, sure Maurice, after showing the math, this example works on a technical financial standpoint, but couldn't even more savings be had if you just used an even cheaper backpack and clothes? We will get to that question in a bit, but first, let's revisit the game we started with. That pocket knife. What dollar amount did you put in your head when you saw it? I mean, whatever that number was, I can almost guarantee that at 250 US dollars, it is so much more than what most of you thought. And yet, because of the second axis, assessing the frequency of use. After three years of ownership so far, it's still certainly budget friendly to me. Since when I'm on home turf in Toronto, very conservatively, I use it at least three times per day, whether it's for earning money at the workshop, opening packages at home, or processing food and other tasks on weekend camping trips. By the way, don't confuse frequency of use with cost versus price. Although seemingly similar on the surface, they are completely different modes of calculation. Cost versus price factors in things that are outside of your control, like when you buy a car, you are paying the price of the car itself, but there are the ongoing costs of insurance, gas, parking, and maintenance, no matter how often or how seldomly you drive. As you're about to see, frequency of use is strictly about what's within your control, how often you will interact and get value with the thing. But back to the Benchmade M4 bailout. Let's do the math. 365 days a year, about half in Toronto, so that's 182 and a half days, and we'll multiply that by the extremely conservative minimum estimate of three uses per day, which gives us at the very least 547 uses per year. I've already had it for three years, and I don't see myself changing it as my daily workhorse anytime soon. But if we only assess based on how long I've already owned it, multiplying 547 uses per year by three years of ownership gives us our current usage count. Then dividing that by the $250 price tag means the cost per use up to this point is 15 cents per use. And again, in reality, it's likely much more than that since at the workshop, there are times when I use it literally 20 to 30 times in a single day. Not to mention the vast majority of those uses are tied directly to me earning a living. So forget cost per use. This knife's earning per use has definitely paid for itself multiple times over. But revisiting that question we hinted at earlier, similar to my carry-on travel bag kit, aren't there knives that cost less that could yield the exact same result? Yes, of course, but there are many other factors, the most important to me being if it inspires the level of confidence in durability that I need for its intended use case. Here is a flipped example on the complete opposite end. When I make flashlight review videos, it helps me to convey visually 
by using a blank white figurine to cycle through any given torch's outputs. For this use case, I don't need this toy to be particularly durable, meaning I don't need a $250 kid robot blank. This $3 paintable freestyle blank is plenty durable for this intended use case. And yet someone somewhere obviously feels like that kid robot joint is totally worth it. And the term worth it, whether we realize it or not, is often naturally and automatically tied to our brain's estimation of frequency of use. And personally, 15 cents per use for something that helps earn a living is not only well worth it, but in fact at 15 cents per use is beyond budget friendly. And yet none of this would matter if I could not afford the knife or one bag travel setup at the time of purchase in the first place. And that leads to the third and final axis of evaluating, which is your own current financial situation. This right here is how I personally assess my personal finance allocations. Yours will likely be different and I'm certainly not making the claim that my breakdown is the correct one. But if you have never broken things down like this before, I highly recommend putting pen to paper today to gain more clarity. Feel free to pause if you care to see the breakdown, but as a quick aside, this line here where I added the words debt servicing, if you've been with me for a bit, you know that once upon a time, I was swimming in tens of thousands of dollars in credit card debt because of my own stupidity. Today, having been debt free for many years, if you or someone you know feels as helpless and hopeless as I did back then, I wrote a 100% free, no strings attached get out of debt workbook, which you can get by scanning this QR code or finding it linked down in the description below. But going back to my personal finance allocations, the final 10% here is what I parse as truly disposable, which means if I want to buy something but don't have enough accumulated in my buildup of that spendable bucket, then I personally define that as not being able to afford it yet. Again, your life, your finance rules. So you define things for yourself. But for me, this generally applies whether I view something as budget friendly or I view it as expensive. By the way, you may be wondering, what the heck? Maurice, you travel so much. Why don't I see airplane tickets and hotels in any of those percentage breakdowns? This breakdown you've been looking at is for my personal income allocations. Because more than 95% of my travels are for business, it's clients or vendors who cover flights and accommodations, or my business bank account that pays for it. This video so far has been all to say that even in a microcosm like a single YouTube video that mentions any product, the comment section will be filled with folks who call it a great deal and an equal number of folks who call it stupidly expensive. Because again, any debate of what is considered budget friendly or expensive is truly pointless. What's much more productive is for me, you, everyone to develop a personal system that enables us all to make spending decisions with internal confidence and clarity. And in fact, this video was just a tiny glimpse. If you are interested in my complete spending system that takes all types of scenarios into account, you will definitely want to watch this video right up here. But also, this is just my viewpoint and has been made in tandem with a few other folks in the EDC collab group, and you can find their thoughts on the topic right down here. I'll leave them both on screen for a few seconds so you can choose which one to watch next, but while you're deciding, consider subscribing and hitting that bell so you'll be notified the moment new videos just like this one drops.